you actually enjoyed your sumptuous uh, lunch. So the next presenter is uh, Peter, uh, and uh, the title of the presentation is uh, The Wealth Pump, Popular Immiseration, uh, Elite Overproduction, and the, and the Path of uh, Political Disintegration. So over to you, Peter. Thank you. Okay, so um, um, sorry that I, I can't attend, uh, you know, physically. Hopefully, this uh, distant uh, presentation works. The main question that motivates uh, my presentation is uh, whether there is a causal connection between economic inequality and uh, social and political instability. Growing economic inequality, especially inequality in uh, income and wealth is currently a broadly shared concern. Uh, it has been a, one of the topics um, of the Davos um, um, uh, meetings and obviously this uh, uh, conference uh, today is addressing that. And it is often adduced that growing inequality is a source of political discord. But is it, and if, it, if, if it's the case, how does it do it? What is the direct uh, mechanism? In fact, there are some reasons to doubt that um, growing inequality uh, might be a direct uh, mechanism for, of instability because humans are very bad at perceiving inequality. There is a number of studies that show that uh, people, when they are asked to estimate uh, the degree of uh, income or wealth inequality, they are basically, uh, uh, their opinions essentially have nothing to do with what is actually uh, is measured by economists. So what I will argue in my uh, talk is that inequality is an uh, excellent proxy for the actual mechanisms that drive uh, instability but the actual drivers of instability are uh, several of which I will focus on two popular immiseration and elite over overproduction. And at a deep structural level, the force that drives those and ultimately instability is what I would refer to as the wealth pump. So that's the plan. Um, to motivate a little bit uh, what's coming, let me go back uh, to uh, 2010 when um, Nature, the journal uh, the Nature, asked a, a number of scientists to, to uh, make some forecasts for the next uh, decade, that is from 2010 to 2020. And that's when I published the forecast uh, that a political, political instability, uh, the growing political instability uh, may be a contributor in the coming decade. And um, 10 years later, in 2020, together with my co-author, Andrei Karataev, we have revisited this um, forecast to see whether it had anything to do with reality. And um, uh, this is one of the, mm -hmm. uh, um, of the graphs uh, that we have uh, looked at. We looked at several measures of instability. One of them was anti-government demonstrations. A very similar picture shows up when we look at violent riots. And so uh, we submitted this paper in early 2020 saying that this forecast was actually right on the money. And of course, um, as the paper was in review, the summer of 2020, the riots following the death of uh, Jim Floyd and uh, uh, have, ex uh, have uh, exploded. And of course, in January of 2021, we had the shocking event of, uh, which has been known as the storming of the uh, capital. So, um, so though the forecast seems uh, to have been uh, quite uh, good, the question is, what was it based on? It was not um, a, what I would call a prophecy, uh, it's, it was a scientific prediction because there is a specific mechanism um, on, on which it was based. And it was also, uh, the forecast was um, 
uh, scientific prediction in a sense that I wanted to stick my neck out, make uh, an out of sample prediction to see whether the mechanisms that have been identified by our theory have actually are working in the way that we thought uh, they are working. So here's what, what I would do now is I'll talk about the theory. So this is structural demographic theory uh, and it uh, uh, posits uh, several forces um, that drive social instability and political violence. For because I don't have a lot of time, I'll focus on two main ones. Uh, these are the uh, uh, first of all mass mobilization potential, and um, uh, it is based on uh, on um, popular immigration resulting from the uh, decreased um, living standards. Uh, for the majority of population, which uh, results in growing mass mobilization uh, potential. This uh, is a fairly obvious um, effect of um, growing inequality, which um, uh, many have uh, uh, brought up. And of course, since the days of Malthus, uh, that that this uh, particular uh, force has been much in discussion. But it turns out that while it's one of the important conditions, the second condition uh, is uh, is much actually much more uh, much much more predictive of immediate troubles to come. And that's intra elite competition, which um, uh, which results from the uh, uh, from when uh, elite numbers increase uh, relative to the general population. As a result of that, we have uh, too many uh, elite aspirants vying for a uh, limited number of positions in of power. And as a result of that, this elite overproduction uh, causes elite uh, uh, inter elite competition, eventually conflict. And that uh, in our analysis of about 100 now uh, cases of past societies sliding into crisis and then out of it, that turns out to be the most universal and most important force. In addition to that, uh, there are other dimensions, uh, the state fragility and international environment, especially for smaller countries, international environment plays quite a role, but, uh, but those, I will focus on the first two. So let's uh, uh, talk about, and specifically I'll use the example of the United States, which I have studied very um, uh, from inside out quite uh, over the past 20 years. Uh, and um, I will illustrate how these two forces lay out in, um, have, have, have played out in real life uh, in, a, in, a, in a particular example of one uh, particular state. So, um, so let's um, look at um, real wages. So wages adjusted for inflation. Yeah, as you can see here on this graph, uh, I'm looking at two measures of um, unskilled wages and manufacturing uh, wages. Manufacturing wages is um, a pretty good proxy for median uh, wages for which we have better data more recently, but for manufacturing uh, wages, we actually have data going back 200, more than 200 years. I'll show that graph in a minute. And what you can see is that in the late 1970s, um, there was a definite uh, phase transition. Uh, up to that point for the previous two generations, the wages for both unskilled and manufacturing workers have been growing quite rapidly and almost linearly. And in the process, let's say the wages for uh, manufacturing workers increased by uh, increased fourfold, uh, which is quite a remarkable achievement for uh, the, in fact, it was unprecedented uh, in human history to see 
such a uh, long-term sustained increase in general well-being. But then um, uh, there was a, something happened and the, the wages stagnated or even declined. So what was the um, reason? Very briefly, uh, I, um, um, I have built a very simple model in which we look um, at the effects of, first of all, um, the GDP per capita, which is the blue line here. You can see that the GDP per capita shows no break in the 1970s. It has uh, slowed down uh, prior to the, around the uh, crisis of 2007-2008. And by the way, notice that all these graphs, they end in, in 2012, because um, that's when um, I published the book, Ages of Discord, uh, in which you can see all the uh, details. Uh, this, this publication happened in um, 2016, just a couple of months before the elections in which Donald Trump became uh, the president. Anyway, so um, uh, it's not because economy slowed that much. Uh, 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 that's not the reason why the real wages st stopped growing. Um, if you include um, estimates of labor demand and supply, you will get uh, now uh, more um, something um, uh, less um, linearly increasing, but still not quite right. And, uh, but if you include proxies for uh, social norms, which here are proxied by real minimum wage, and you can discuss that if uh, during the question stacks uh, uh, why this is uh, actually a good proxy for that. So once we include those uh, ideological and um, uh, institutional factors, suddenly the model works uh, very well. In fact, even it even predicts uh, that um, decrease uh, up to 1990s and slight increase during the 1990s. Right, so essentially, again, I don't um, have time to go deeply into this, uh, uh, this uh, model, but um, uh, the main um, uh, take home message that uh, I take from here is that we can delve into this, uh, into this processes and, and understand why the, um, why uh, uh, economic uh, measures of well-being uh, went through a phase uh, transition during the 1970s. Um, and this, um, uh, the economic well-being uh, well -being measures have been paralleled by additional measures of well-being. I have looked uh, in particular um, into biological proxies and also other proxies such as social proxies. But uh, here again, let me just briefly say that uh, but here's one very um, uh, good measure, which actually works very well for uh, the thousands of human history um, in terms of measuring uh, well-being. And of course, uh, uh, it is actually a surprise that um, such Malthusian measures work so well uh, in our supposedly post-Malthusian um, uh, age. In any case, uh, this graph shows the uh, average height for um, uh, four different segments of population, white men, black men, white women, and black women. And you notice that the scales for men and women are shifted because uh, for obvious reasons. And what you see here, again, you see that um, this proxy for biological well-being was showing quite a nice increase and then stagnation. Meanwhile, uh, if you compare it to the um, average height of, let's say, Western European populations, they continued to grow, whereas in the United States, they uh, stagnated. Um, so if we um, now look at the average of these things, uh, rather than four different segments, the, the average is this, um, um, uh, this thick uh, gray uh, curve, all right? And if we compare it to economic wages, but shift it in time, 
okay? So, so average uh, height uh, is the, by the birth uh, cohort uh, of the cohort of the population. So this is the upper scale. You can see the break uh, here happens um, around 1960. Whereas the real wage, uh, the break happens uh, uh, in the late 1970s, as you can see on the bottom uh, scale. So the shift here is 15 years. What um, uh, the way I interpret this graph is that um, th that uh, first of all we know that there are two growth spurts. First, the first growth spurt when uh, babies um, uh, grow, then the growth slows, and then there is a second growth spurt during the teenage years, and uh, uh, which is roughly speaking about 15 um, uh, plus minus. Uh, years of age. So essentially what this graph says is that when the economic well-being of the parent generation stopped growing, right, it has affected the heights of, of their of the next generation, their children who, uh, who, were, uh, who were born, let's say the break point, the children born in 1960 were uh, about 15 years in 1975, all right? And so the conditions under which they have experienced their second uh, growth spurt was uh, the economic conditions apparently uh, was the driver for this uh, stop in the uh, advance of average stature. And, um, uh, okay, um, I'll, I'll mention some other, um, another, some other biological proxies or social biological proxies. But let's, um, uh, as I said, uh, we have data uh, going back uh, more than 200 years, actually, to the very beginnings of the um, American uh, Republic. Um, and when you do that, um, if, if you look at real wages, right, um, and especially if you look at GDP per capita, you um, you don't uh, you, you don't see uh, um, uh, uh, you don't see um, well let me put it this way um, uh, <clears throat> United States has uh, changed quite dramatically during the last two hundred years especially uh, in starting in the mid nineteenth century as a result of industrialization and things like that. And so when we look at uh, this data, especially like GDP, what we see is, uh, you know, increasing, even seemingly accelerating uh, growth of uh, GDP per capita, which is, uh, as economists um, make this point, is a measure of average income, all right? But uh, there are some very important and interesting cyclic processes happening around this uh, overall increase. And we can reveal it by looking at what I call relative wage. So the relative wage is we take the median, uh, some measure of median wage, and divide it by uh, the, a measure of average um, income, all right? And so when we do that, when we divide this graph by that graph, we get this. So suddenly what we see here is uh, there are periods when the relative wage was growing up and the re uh, periods when it was uh, growing down or stagnating. And then again, there are two uh, cycles here. And this, uh, I um, argue, it's a very important thing. So what's happening during these periods up to 1830s and then from 1910 up to the uh, uh, early 1960s is that uh, the wage grew faster than GDP per capita. So um, a measure of median income um, grew faster than mean income, right? So for the, clearly something is happening with the redistribution here. And then there are periods when um, the opposite was uh, happening. And so we looked um, at, uh, uh, in the previous slides, we looked at this period. Um, and of course, there was some delay before the relative wage uh, started decreasing. And that has caused uh, real wage, which is um, uh, inflation adjusted wage to 
stop growing. But essentially, during these periods, what you see here is that the fruits of economic growth are not uh, equitably distributed between workers and, um, and others. They uh, are disproportionately flowing towards, uh, towards the economic elites during these periods here and there. And so we can think about this process as a kind of a wealth pump, which is, of course, the title of my talk. So the, the, the wealth pump at this point is pumping uh, income from workers to economic elites. So the economic elites are not only capital holders. These are also, they are also CEOs um, uh, who are, um, you know, who are wage, uh, who get wages. Um, yeah, right. Um, but these, they, but they are economic elites. That's why it's important to look at the median uh, wage rather than average wage, because average wage averages CEOs together with their workers, but median wage uh, or mean or um, wage of unskilled labor, uh, which looks at even lower levels of uh, income distribution, that uh, cuts off those um, those. Um, top uh, wages. And the wealth pump uh, can operate in both directions. So during this period here, the wealth pump was actually working in reverse. It was taking, uh, it was giving more to the workers and, uh, and uh, uh, taking away from the uh, economic elites and wealth holders. Okay. Um, and uh, now, if we look at that, uh, at the second part, so here, uh, let's look at this uh, cycle, starting from around, around 1900 to today, then um, here are some um, very familiar measures of economic inequality. Uh, uh, here I show share of uh, income by top 1% and share of wealth by uh, top 1%. And what we see here is the inverse of that uh, of the um, relative wage. So when relative wage is declining, uh, sorry, when relative wage is growing, um, the economic inequality is declining and vice versa. So this is the operation of this wealth pump that I'm talking about. And um, uh, here, uh, of course, uh, looking at the same period, you see that other measures this, uh, such as deaths of despair, uh, they uh, they show a very similar uh, cyclic uh, behavior, which is uh, paralleled by the economic um, um, economic indicators. All right, so so much. I don't want to talk too much about immiseration, um, but just mention that uh, several proxies that we can actually look through the. Uh, more than 200 years of American history, they are changing in this. Uh, we have seen two cycles, essentially, of well-being uh, during this period. And this is quite typical when we compare it to many other past societies. We see these recurrent uh, ups and downs in um, uh, measures of well-being when we do have uh, good enough data to detect it. All right, so what about elite overproduction? Um, it's, um, first of all, let me uh, uh, give you a quick definition. So by elites, I mean the small percentage of population that concentrates social power in their hands. So it's a neutral definition. The elites are not, neither good nor bad. Simply, they're simply power holders. All right, so uh, what does the wealth pump do at, um, on the elite side of the equation? <clears throat> Declining real relative wages of workers set up this wealth pump that transfers, transfers wealth from workers to the economic elites. And so um, as a result of that, um, a larger uh, fraction of GDP goes to those who consume labor, the economic elites, which are both capital holders and top um, 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 layers of uh, uh, administration of uh, corporations, corporate officers. 
And um, this creates a favorable economic conjuncture for the economic elites and results in high rates of upward uh, social mobility. Elite numbers as a result of that grow and so do their consumption levels. So far, so good. But the problem is that as in many dynamical systems, there are some mm, uh, delayed uh, effects of uh, such uh, dynamics. Well, but first of all, let's take a look at some uh, numbers. Here is uh, here uh, here are some data on the mm, uh, on the relative distribution of wealth in the American population. We have good data from 1983 uh, uh, to 2019, and there should be soon. Uh, 2022 coming on, on, uh, online. But in any case, when we look at the percentage of households with net worth exceeding a certain, and this is, by the way, uh, inflation adjusted. So here uh, we are talking about measuring net, uh, net worth in 1995 US dollars. What we see here is that the proportion of uh, households has been increasing. So this is the effect of this wealth pump operating, the uh, millionaires, roughly 10% or so of the population uh, 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 now, well, 7% now, in increased from 3% to 7%. But um, the growth uh, at, in larger wealth classes, such as deca millionaires, was even more remarkable. Here we see the uh, more than five-fold, six-fold increase in the uh, proportion of um, households that are uh, that uh, have ten million uh, dollars uh, will uh, work, uh, wealth or more. So, so here is this uh, um, effect on the numbers of um, of economic elites. All right. So uh, the problem is um, that eventually, if if um, if the wealth pump is allowed to run long enough, eventually what's going to happen is that growing elite numbers and their consumption levels will overshoot the productive base, which is what the workers are producing. And uh, as a result of that, remember that elites need to reproduce themselves. So the new elites, let's call them elite aspirants, right? their numbers uh, at some point uh, begin to be so large that there is not enough power positions so in, let's say, in the politics or uh, in economics. So the numbers, let's say economics, the number of CEOs uh, and other top officers in Fortune 500 uh, companies, but is, is obviously limited, but also even more obviously the number of, posi of positions in politics. So there's only one uh, president, uh, only 100 senators and so on and so forth. That's uh, that's fixed. And as the numbers of elite aspirants vying for these positions increase, then um, uh, first of all, as a result of that is inter-elite competition. And secondly, as the number of elite aspirants, uh, numbers of elite aspirants grow, uh, there are numbers of frustrated elite aspirants who are denied this access uh, to these positions begins to explode. So here we see it um, um, uh, playing out in the political uh, domain. Uh, you, you can see that the numbers of um, candidates, now these are during the primaries, because of course, most of the time uh, after the primaries, there's only two candidates. But if you looked, uh, if you count uh, the number of candidates uh, in both parties during the primaries, you can see that their numbers have been increasing in just that uh, decade from 2000 and 2010. But what's more, what's more interesting is the number of candidates who, are, uh, who have um, spent uh, half a million dollars or more of their own money. So these are the millionaires, all right? Uh, they have doubled during this uh, period. So what's happening is that many of the wealth holders apparently want to uh, aim to Mm, translate their uh, their uh, economic uh, power into political power. And you can give, I'm sure, 
you can think of a number of uh, such individuals in American politi uh, politics. And another measure is the cost of uh, winning. This is in inflation adjusted uh, dollars. It has been growing also, showing the greater demand for these positions and a greater willingness to spend money to get them. So this is, uh, uh, this, this, this is a clear process for increased uh, competition uh, for, and by the way, not every, not all of these uh, um, candidates are, uh, you know, uh, wealthy in their own right. Many of the newly wealthy uh, individuals, instead of running themselves for office, they choose to, uh, to, um, uh, to fund other uh, individuals. So essentially the effect of increasing a number of wealth holders uh, is translated into increased competition for uh, political positions. And the problem is just uh, is that uh, as we get uh, greater numbers of these surplus elites, right, they, some of them turn into what they call counter elites. These are uh, the individuals who are willing to challenge their uh, the reigning regime, um, and um, um, in history, oftentimes even by violent means, and in fact, this is happening in the United States, but certainly uh, uh, they're willing to break the rules of the game. So this is how elite overproduction drives uh, uh, inter-elite competition, uh, inter-elite conflict, uh, rise of the counter-elites, and then um, social political instability. And just returning back to what, where I started, we, we can see now that inequality is not, a, in this at least uh, uh, model, is not a direct driver, it's a proxy for, um, for, um, for the direct drivers, which is immiseration and uh, elite uh, overproduction. So if we look um, at, this is what I did in my book, Ages of Discord, I looked at the, at the uh, more than 200 years of American history. So the cur blue curve is an um, is a, uh, aggregated measure of well-being. And we can see here that it has gone through two cycles. And the red curve is a measure of instability. And so this was published uh, in 2016, as I uh, said. All right, so uh, let's see. I'm almost out of time. So what I'll, I'll, uh, I'll very quickly just talk about implications. Um, and there are a number of implications. So my colleague, uh, Walter Scheidel, um, has uh, expressed uh, a pessimistic view in his book, Great Leveler, all right, where he says that death is the great leveler. So basically a major um, uh, violent shock is needed to reverse uh, the uh, uh, economic inequality. I see uh, a bit more, I look at this more, a bit more optimistically. Essentially, entry into the crisis is relatively stereotypical. That's what our uh, crisis DB uh, investigations uh, show. And interrelated uh, conflict plays a key role together with mass mobilization. But the exit um, is hugely uh, contingent. And in fact, there could be both good and bad um, outcomes as indicated in this graph. Sometimes the uh, decline is mild and followed for rapid recovery, but there's also, you can also have complete collapse. Um, so what um, we did, we actually looked at uh, outcomes of crisis, measuring them by a collapse. I don't like the word collapse because who knows what collapse means. So what we did is we broke it up into various dimensions. And then uh, we can look at um, more than 100 cases in crisis DB and look at the distribution of the severity where the severity means basically we simply sum up the possible, possible uh, uh, bad things that happen to societies. And what you see here, it's, it's quite lopsided. Most of the time, um, 
the crisis lead to pretty dire consequences. But there is about 10, 15% of cases where the elites managed to pull together, adopt the right set of reforms and uh, sail the ship of the state through the turbulent waters uh, without major bloodshed. All right, so to conclude, um, the, um, uh, uh, the structural uh, causes of ages uh, of discord, uh, I have shown you example using the United States, but this is, uh, they're quite generic and they, go, they show up over and over in uh, the more than 100 uh, cases of past crisis. And um, um, we are now uh, in the United States, we are clearly in crisis. Uh, it's really, uh, we are at, at the cusp where uh, in fact, collective action can result in positive outcomes or negative outcomes. What will happen, we will see. And finally, I just want to say that I have a book coming out in June, which uh, describes uh, my current thinking about these uh, issues uh, much better. So if you are interested in what I have just told you, you can read in detail more about it in that book. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for your presentation. Uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll open up uh, the floor for uh, questions. So thank you very much uh, for your presentation, Matteo Marsili. Um, and uh, so one question I have is uh, how uh, specific is uh, what you have this been discussing to the to the UI, uh, with specific to the UIs? Uh, because there, uh, I mean, there is a, I mean, it's, it's the country of, say, well, liberal economy is it, at its best. Uh, and, and so this link between uh, politics and, uh, uh, and economics uh, is particularly strong. So I wonder how much of this conclusion can be generalized to other, say, countries. Yes. In fact, I should say that, um, the theory was developed on, uh, uh, on pre-industrial societies. Uh, and um, uh, I, I started on this, pro uh, on this project, uh, looking, applying theory to the United States, um, because many times when I gave talks about the previous um, crisis, um, such as the English Civil War, and uh, even going back to the crisis of the Roman Republic and so on and so forth, people, kept asking me, where uh, are we? So um, at a very um, at a, a very deep and abstract level, these forces, uh, immiseration and elite overproduction, they are playing out uh, in very similar ways in very different societies. However, you need, the theory has to be tailored to, um, to each uh, society because as, as I was arguing, the critical uh, dimension is what's happening to the elites. Now, uh, different societies have, um, uh, there, there, uh, there is a variety of ways in which elites are defined and uh, recruited, uh, uh, regenerated. Um, and uh, so even if you look, uh, look at, uh, um, you know, Western democracies, uh, if you compare United States let's say to France, United States is basically a plutocracy. The, um, uh, the reigning elite is the economic elite in collaboration with the political elites. But France uh, is, a, is a bureaucracy. Uh, in France, the elites are uh, uh, created in uh, different ways. And, and there are other um, uh, examples of other societies, like in Egypt, for example, it's militocracy, essentially. So those details are very important. And um, that's, why, that's why the general uh, ideas, illegal reproduction, they have to be filtered through the specific structures of uh, different societies. And of course, obviously, the democratic societies have different 
uh, ways that, pow that power flows in them compared to autocratic societies and so on and so forth. So uh, in, in answer to your question, if we, um, if we um, take a step back from specific arrangements uh, in which power flows in societies and focus on more, um, you know, on more structural, more, uh, more uh, fundamental issues, then the theory works surprisingly well um, and seems to be, uh, for, for, at this point, essentially um, all um, state level complex societies but so if, I, if I so it looks to me that uh, there is a particularly important positive feedback uh, between uh, in a, between say uh, economics uh, and politics uh, in, in in the sense that the economic elite control political power and and and, and I wonder how much this is uh, specific to uh, to the U.S., I mean, the, this rise and, and which control redistribution policy, politics. So there is a pod, positive feedback loop. And I was, my question was how much this is a universal feature or how much this is a necessary feature in your theory? So the, the necess necessary uh, feature, as I said, is the uh, elite of production and uh, immiseration uh, so, and, uh, okay, um, let me give you another uh, example. Let's take, let's look at a more traditional society in which the elites are nobility, landed nobility, and things like that. So the way the wealth pump operates there is that, um, that when the elite of production uh, occurs, right, then, uh, you, then uh, the nobles basically oppress peasants and turn on the, the wealth pump. So instead of economic mechanisms uh, that uh, transfer uh, wealth from commoners to the elite, in this case, we have more coercion uh, methods, all right? So this is a variation on the theme, but um, essentially uh, in any society, uh, where however elites are defined, whether they're economic, uh, administrative, military, or ideological, um, they uh, need to support a certain uh, level of, um, uh, of uh, income. And so when their numbers grow, inevitably, they have to extract that income from the commoners. Thank you. Um, Luis Betancourt, it's great to see you again, Peter. Um, you probably can't see me, but great talk. I had a question related to what you just said in this argument for how necessary the elite, elite overproduction and interconflict is necessary for your theory. I know it is, but you, uh, I'm asking a clarification. Um, the immiseration part seems very clear, and particularly when it affects large fractions of the population, right? Uh, large majorities. But, but the elite overproduction, specifically, there's been arguments, for example, by Douglas North and others that some elite conflict between different groups of the elite actually can lead to more in, impersonal institutions that then can start to serve the more general population and eventually lead to better government. But you seem to have an argument that doesn't open that as a possibility and tends to be negative. So could you elaborate a little bit on that? When is that uh, potentially a good thing and when is it necessarily bad? Sure. Yeah, um, well, we have to think dynamically, which is not probably um, um, a surprise to you. So um, I'm talking about the societies entering into crisis. And then remember, then societies somehow have to get out of it. So in Douglas North and his colleagues, for example, they look specifically at the Glorious Revolution. The Glo Glor Glorious Revolution was the exit from... Um, from about 60 years of conflict, which started uh, you know, in Scottish Wars, uh, 1639, and then uh, it ended in the 1690s uh, with the new arrangements. So um, of course, um, um, when societies um, uh, uh, exit from this crisis, uh, sometimes though, by the way, they don't exit. They essentially have political fragmentation. You know, think about Roman Empire, uh, which has fragmented, and uh, there was no new Roman Empire. 
but um, uh, but frequently we do have a reconstitution, and so you, uh, England, for example, reconstituted it itself. So think about it dynamically, um, uh, and uh, both about uh, from, you have to look uh, the path to the crisis, and then and then the path out of uh, the crisis. Now, oh, let me just add one thing. So, immiseration is important, but um, if you think about it, uh, it's not. Uh, you, societies can live actually pretty, be pretty stable with quite a lot of uh, immiseration. As long as the elites are united uh, and the state is strong, uh, that, uh, that the state uh, can uh, suppress all those uh, peasant rebellions. Uh, it's really, that's why the elites are critical. Uh, all of them are successful, let's put it this in quote marks, all successful revolutions and civil wars were a result of uh, intra-elite um, um, uh, uh, intra um, um, uh, uh, conflicts. Even today, if you look at Donald Trump, who is sort of the main uh, revolutionary, so to speak, um, you know, he is not uh, particularly immiserated himself, but he's channeling he's channeling the tens of millions of uh, immiserated Americans. Um, so this is Sanjay Jain from Delhi. Um, uh, I'd like to um, ask a question which might or might not be related to what you're uh, talking about, but I'm just wondering if it is. This is the question of climate change and ecological catastrophe. And um, uh, first of all, uh, do you think that uh, the processes that um, uh, are leading to the political instability that you talked about are the processes that are also leading to the climate change and ecological overshoot related? Um, that's one. And the second is that uh, how is this um, inequality and um, you know, the, the, the wealth pump that you mentioned um, how is this going to uh, play itself out um, in the context of the climate crisis and the ecological overshoot? So the first question we have, uh, uh, this has not yet been published, but we are, we have analyzed crisis DB uh, because there's uh, plenty of data on weather proxies. And essentially to cut the long story short, uh, weather uh, climate uh, worsening seems to serve often as a trigger for um, for crisis. But uh, uh, it, the key question is whether uh, the societies have resilience. And this resilience, when population uh, is not immiserated and elites are not overproduced, uh, the social uh, stability and resilience is very high, and societies ad adjust. Uh, reasonably well to climate shocks. It's really when uh, the um, drivers for instability have been working for a while. That's when the climate uh, can often serve as the trigger. And uh, same thing, um, and this is actually answers your second question. The uh, societies um, adjust to, uh, to climatic shocks when they are internally coherent and the social cooperation is high and therefore uh, they can find solutions. But when um, the such, crisis, such um, uh, climate, climate shocks happen when the elites are divided, essentially different factions of elites start using the, uh, that climate shocks as a weapon in international struggle. We see this in the United States where one party denies the climate uh, tends to, not everybody over there, but, um, uh, but there is quite a large uh, fraction of the, uh, climate uh, change deniers. And so it has become part of the political infighting rather than trying to find a collective decision, collective action that would uh, address the, this issue. Davide Fiaschi from University of Pisa. Uh, um, I'm really interested on the, uh, on the explanation of the, or the true explanation of the change in the dynamics of real wages. 
So you have a model that uh, if you are an economist, uh, generally there are uh, some variables that are considering, considered uh, uh, endogenous, no? Uh, demand, supply of labor, something like this. But uh, have you any true intuition? So in other words, is, uh, your explanation is based, for example, a change in the technology used in the, in the economy, or there is uh, some endogenous political cycle uh, behind these after the Second World War, something like this. Because you, maybe you know, and I'm sure that you know that there are different explanations on this evidence, no? Technological against uh, competition between the two big system, no? Capitalist against the socialist system and so on. So I'm really interested to your opinion uh, or your uh, idea. Thank you. Yeah, well, both um, exogenous and endogenous. So, of course, the uh, human societies have changed dramatically over the past couple of hundred years, and you have to take that into account. So one of these issues is with uh, many people talk about now, especially because of chat GPT, the effect of, um, uh, of uh, technology, the uh, automation and, of, and robotization, and that is certainly a force that reduces labor supply. But other things were United States that played the United States uh, at the level of labor uh, supply were, first of all, uh, the baby boom that, uh, that uh, created a, a large cohort of uh, workers. Um, and secondly, the entry of women into um, um, a massive entry of women into the labor force and um, immigration. Immigration actually uh, is much discussed, but numerically it's less, uh, slightly less important than the demographic, the other demographic forces that we're talking about. So these are, in a way, um, uh, what's, what's exogenous, what's endogenous, it's really a matter of what our best model is, because you can endogenize uh, things. But some things cannot be endogenized. So um, the uh, automation process, that this is a very long-term process that has been happening over thousands of years, actually. Um, and so in my model, that's clearly an exogenous mechanism. But what's, uh, what's the most important to me endogenous mechanism is the, the, the last thing that I included in the model, which is the attitudes. And, and so it's, it's, think about it as institutions. Um, um, the uh, labor's, uh, labor promoting institutions were installed in the United States as a result of the New Deal. And they worked very well until late 70s. And then they were started to be dismantled in the late 70s, especially under the Reagan administration. And so I use uh, uh, the minimum wage as a proxy for the elite attitudes towards, uh, towards uh, workers. It seems to work quite well, but we could use other proxies such as, you know, uh, illegal um, uh, anti-labor uh, uh, moves by, um, by firms. So, uh, so that is an endogenous uh, mechanism in the theory because, and I don't, because I don't have time, I don't want to speak too much. Essentially, what happens is that um, when you have crisis that either uh, destroys part of the elites or frightens them so much that they install institutions that are more pro-labor. And that lasts uh, until the collective memory of the crisis fades. And then you have, it's a cycling process in this uh, sense. And uh, I, I talk much more about it uh, in my book. So uh, that's where I un unpack these ideas. Thank you. Um, Andreas Flache from the University of Groningen. Um, I, I was wondering how you think about the competition between different political systems as a potentially stabilizing factor. So there has been this argument by the German uh, so social sociological economist or economic sociologist, if you want, uh, Strick, who argues that, argued that, let's say, uh, until the end of the Cold War, there was a sort of uh, pressure on the elites, particularly in the West, to show that their system is actually better than the communist system and therefore a welfare state needed to be built up and maintained. 
Uh, but when that competition was winding down, uh, this pressure was less, and so the welfare state relatively declined, which uh, would have worked then against the stability of the system. So I'm wondering how you think about that argument. Oh, de de decidedly. So this actually feeds well into the, my, the previous question. I, in, in my book, Ages of Discord, I talk about the uh, progressive period so 1920s especially. I remember the first, the original Red, red Scare was uh, in the 1920s. So when we, when we look at the existence of the Soviet Union established in 1920 and collapsed in 1989, this is the period when I grew up, by the way, in the Soviet Union. And um, I, I remember uh, how the newspapers like Pravda we're, we're talking about the horrors of uh, capitalism. And uh, clearly, uh, and that, uh, that was, a big, uh, there's uh, multiple lines of evidence that show that the influence from the Soviet Union, by the way, also from the Nazi Germany uh, during the 1930s, those were, um, in fact, important influences on the Roosevelt administration in them designing uh, an equitable uh, system. So, um, and then of course, when the um, Soviet Union was uh, collapsed, it was misinterpreted as uh, the uh, triumph of uh, neo um, liberal economics and so on and so forth. And he, he, here we are, essentially. So I agree, this, uh, this, uh, this is an important factor. It feeds, so the fear by the elites uh, it could be a, a both uh, inter uh, due, due to internal challenges. And by the way, in the 1920s, there were challenges from, uh, well, a little bit earlier, from 1890s, there was a challenges from the populist movement in the United States and the socialist movement in the United States, all right? So those were internal, but there were also an external um, uh, influence from uh, the competitors, such as the Soviet Union. Yeah. And also, the German welfare state in the 19th century was built up uh, partially uh, to, to combat the social democrats or socialists, so to say, uh, take away their social influence. Okay, thanks a lot. Any other questions? Oh. So thank you for the talk. I, I was wondering, going back to crisis, that severely affects society. There is this ongoing crisis, this opioid crisis in the US, and this is a very unequal crisis. It affects very specific socio demographic sectors. And I was wondering, can you formulate in the same terms that you have formulated other crises, I mean, within your framework, or is this something, a completely different mechanism? Yes, so thank you for this question. So what I claim is that structural geographic theory actually allows us to, it, it gives us a, a very good the theoretical framework within which we can look at many different seemingly disparate uh, trends in the United States. And they suddenly start making sense when you put them into this demographic, structural, structural geographic framework. Remember that I was talking about deaths of despair so um, he, I would argue that, um, you, that uh, the opioid crisis is one of the manifestations of, uh, of the immiseration. And in fact, I don't uh, hear, I can be, let's go to the case and uh, Deaton uh, original book uh, uh, project on, uh, on um, deaths of despair they make this argument very eloquently with a lot of uh, data, much better than I can do it. So, so um, uh, opioid crisis is part of the bundle of reasons why immiserated population of people, of, which results in large swaths of population who are falling down and, um, and many of them take their uh, 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 take the way out by either uh, drugs and overdosing or from suicide or from alcoholism. Um, uh, so those, uh, or even simply become careless uh, and uh, die in accidents and things like that. 
So this is uh, clearly, and thanks to uh, MKs and, and Angus Deaton for their excellent work, because here you can really see how these are connected. They talk in the book is excellent. They talk about social immiseration, broken families, you know, and uh, uh, and many other things. It's really is uh, it really is uh, mm, a very uh, coherent mm, understanding of this um, of these problems. Okay, uh, thank you. Any other questions? Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter, uh, for your talk, and uh, thank you very much for the time to uh, respond to the question that we have posed by the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you.